цьому заліку вони і ведуть боротьбу. І подивіться, одразу є пресених на... UTC, Ukrainian Touring Championship. Ukrainian Touring Cars, not like most of the Touring Car competitions around the world. In the UK, it will probably be considered as being club racing in equipment and organisation. Looking from the outside, some would consider it below that. With a selection of cars with routes in the former Eastern Bloc, the ubiquitous Ford Fiesta ST150 is the bedrock for the series. There are a few interesting additions that filled the field out last time the championship ran in 2020, and a number that was set to compete in the 2022 relaunch. The country doesn't have a rich heritage in motor racing in the way that Britain, France or Germany does. Almost all the countries that were hemmed in by the Iron Curtain lack that in comparison to the traditional European motorsport powerhouse nations. Ukraine hasn't had the economic drive to use motor racing as a beacon to attract investment and tourism to shift international perceptions since the collapse of the USSR. There were circuits built in the area of the Alliance during the communist period. Croatia and Czechoslovakia hosted Grand Prix motorcycling. Hungary brought Formula 1 to the East in 1986. USSR racing took place in Georgia as well as in Russia itself and Ukraine, while Poland and Lithuania delivered some of the stars of racing in the region from their own offerings. The list of countries that was part of, or under the influence of the USSR, that have built circuits since the fall of communism has grown year on year though. Alongside the turgid adaptation of the former Olympic village at Sochi, the Russians have built a series of identical bland Herman Tilga tracks. Estonia, Romania, Slovakia, they have also entered the free with new facilities. Some are built as an emblem of personal wealth, or thanks to the spoils of nature being exploited with oil and gas fortunes, and some are constructed with the principle of being a working, profitable venue that serves a local community. This is the case with Oschersleben in the former German Democratic Republic, which was one of the first post-communist tracks to be constructed. It hasn't quite happened in Ukraine, although it nearly did. Russian businessman Anatoly Kushman launched the Crimean Grand Prix circuit in 2010, which stalled after two years due to lack of funds before any track service had been laid. The Russian invasion of the peninsula in 2014 made the venue which was also intended to host the Ukrainian Touring Championship, a place where nobody would want to go for political reasons. There has been no fossil fuel wealth in Ukraine, or a government sports washing campaign, or a personal benefactor to bring a high level circuit to the country. Kazakhstan is ready for a MotoGP, Azerbaijan hosts Formula One. In the last 20 years, Russia has built nine permanent circuits, including two Formula One level tracks. In Ukraine, nothing like that has emerged, and as such, the sport of motor racing has remained niche, and it has not built a status of elitism as it has in other states formerly under Soviet influence. There's only one permanent facility in the country, the Autodrom Chaika, which translates as Seagull Autodrom. It's also known as the Kiev Ring. The circuit was constructed in 1975. And prior to the Russian invasion in 2022, it was for all intents and purposes original. The track surface was what in this country would be considered poor condition, patched here and there through an ongoing battle to keep it usable. Armco, where it exists, is below standards that we're used to in the United Kingdom. Spectator enclosures are positioned in places that simply wouldn't be allowed over here, and the pit lane entrance would create a bit of discussion too. It is, however, the heart of Ukrainian motor racing, and it is an important centre for the sport in the country, not just in circuit racing, but also in bike racing, drifting and rallying. In the 70s the circuit was known as being fast and challenging when used for cup of peace and friendship racing. Single seaters were regular visitors to the track. Cars with a weight limit of 435 kilograms using an engine from a communist manufacturer with tyres manufactured within the block with a height of 80s competition. Constructors from many of the collective states raced into the decade, but as the totalitarian rule across the region ended, the single-seater category began to fade. There have been attempts to revive it over the last few years, but heading into 2022, there was not a huge amount of suitable machines ready for a fully-fledged series. Only half of the circuit was in use, the last time that racing took place at the venue. 
After Ukrainian independence, the track, which had initially been constructed as part of an armed forces project, passed to the ownership of the Ukrainian military, who did not have the funds to keep maintenance to an operational level. The circuit fell into disrepair. A tidy up in time for the 2005 season allowed circuit racing to resume, although there was a cap on engine size for entrance, for safety reasons. In the years since, racing in the country has seen a rise in popularity. When competition resumed at the renewed circuit, they drew in decent crowds. Despite some local politic and dividing the circuit owner, the promoter and the local federation, an agreement was settled and the track became a focal point again for racing in the country. Although it is the only permanent facility in the country, there was an attempt to launch a street track for international racing at the turn of the millennium. A second venue was added to the Ukrainian Touring Championship schedule a couple of years ago. Odessa, a street circuit of sorts, or a highway heading southwest towards the coastal town of Ovidopol. Again, the track is something that could be taken from the past in terms of setup. Essentially, it runs along two sides of a highway with no barriers separating the two lanes as cars return in the opposite direction. A couple of tyre chicanes will run up a service road and a hairpin complete the track. There are no temporary barriers or stands, the spectators just view from the highway embankments. In a way, race in the country is not being limited by red tape, and in a way, it's reminiscent of how things were in the UK in the 60s and 70s. The idea would be knocked back in a second in Western Europe now without millions being spent in feasibility studies and track infrastructure planning. Even then it would likely be rejected, but here enthusiasm trumps reasoning when it comes to making things happen. To the outside of the whole thing seems a little hodgepodge, and that includes the cars. The three division setup was governed the Ukrainian Touring Series for a number of years, GT Open, Touring and Super Touring. Not the two litre behemoths that dominated 90s competition around the globe, I may add. Before the invasion, a reorganisation had been planned for 2022. Hopefully, that will come to light as soon as is practicable, once this war has ended. As mentioned earlier, many of the competing cars have their roots in the Eastern Bloc. The Vaz 2108, or Lada Samara in the UK, is the numerically dominant model along with other offerings from the company. The odd example of the boxy larder Reaver makes appearances and two machines rarely seen on our shores, the Kalina and the Prioria, fill out the second half of the grid. At the sharp end, the Fiesta ST150 is the mainstay. The odd BMW has popped up, along with a couple of examples of the Honda S2000 and from the same manufacturer, the CRX. It's a mix comparable to some of the British regional championships like the North East based Northern Saloon and Sports Car Championship and the North West based CNC Head Series in the way that cars of very different classes race together. So, you can draw together that Ukrainian touring cars are similar to a club level form of racing in Britain. From a technical, administrative and facility point of view, it's been below what would pass in the West as a leading championship, but the passion I mentioned makes the race in the country as relevant to its participants as forms of racing elsewhere do to their own members. If you listen to the thoughts of 2020 runner-up Andrei Yevashensko, you get a similar gist to any other racer in the world after finishing the race in second, in this case to Igor Skuz. <laughs> Here he says that his plan to challenge Skuz for the lead didn't quite work out, but the next time he plans to improve on the runners-up position in his next race, with that he's happy with the competition between the two leaders because it was close and that the racing was respectful, clean and fair. He points out he had a few issues with his car, but the leader was defending so well that a last lap challenge was beyond him. Scuzz himself, here on a scorcher of a day, when things didn't go right, well, he's no different to other races around the world. The five-time Ukrainian touring car champion, Yerum, needs that. It was good to qualify at the front of the grid, but the race was spoiled by a number of issues with the car. The electrics struggled before failing completely. They really were taking a hit from the hot weather. He also found the heat to be testing as well. But you just commit to it and get through into your rhythm. 
He also says that it was good to see the fans out in the stands, though. They could see it was hot. They were able to grab drinks and whatnot, and they appreciated that they came to the track to watch. As for the car, thanks to the temperature it overheated and the pipe came loose, there was a lot of steam released, and there was no way at all to make good repair and get the car back out on track. We missed the end of the race, but it's good that the stands are full and that the fans watched a good battle for the lead. Volodymyr Drogometsky, who was the last person to be crowned champion before the Russian invasion, tells us the conditions in the heat were difficult, making the race a real struggle. But he says he was able to make a breakaway at the start of the race, and he was also able to manage a gap till the end, even though things were stacked against him. But he says that he had to do it for his family, who couldn't be there that day. But their inspiration has pushed him to get on and to get that result in the race. Familiar voices in racing, in any language, but for 2022, and for quite a while yet, those are voices that will remain in the past, as many of those who raced in the series are now engaged in the war effort. Ukrainian Touring Championship might be at the bottom of the FIA pile for now, but it would be foolhardy to dismiss how racing works out in the Ukraine. Their way of doing things answers some questions that are asked in the UK about racing at a similar point. Like how do you get fans through the doors? The conversation is long standing about crowds and national and club racing. We essentially look at racing at grassroots as being the automotive version of Sunday League football watched by one man and his dog. By necessity the Ukrainian series has had to find a way to keep a crowd entertained. With there only being one championship on the bill, the timetable offers two hours of free practice, an hour of qualifying and two one-hour slots for the two races in their build-up. That's five hours of track time in a ten-hour day. Actually, that's still better than what you would get on a Formula One Grand Prix Sunday. But they came to the realisation, draw the fans in and give them a good time. Quality street food, at a reasonable price. Car club exhibitions. Very low entry prices, a playground and a fairground, drift taxi, hot laps, car culture, open media sessions, anything to get the crowd involved, making sure the cars and drivers are positioned to welcome spectators, a very, very positive and proactive relationship with as much media as possible, which is how you get the message out. It pays off with a dedicated following, and it's something that British racing, at all levels, could look to as an influence. Once again, however, all of this is on hold. The circuit was hit in the early days of the war. To what extent the damage is, I don't know. I do know that apart from some damage to the track itself, at the very beginning of the war, that some of the garages holding the cars that you've seen in this video were destroyed, along with the contents. The contacts I have in the country haven't been able to exactly verify personally the current condition of the venue, but I do understand that it will need a lot of work. But it will be far from being a priority once the hostile actions of Russia cease. There are some noses that would be upturned at what is accepted in the country, but the desire for motorsport is undimmed. Community, that is at the heart of the existence of the racing scene in the capital of the country. Drifting, bike racing, time attack, stock cars, rally, the all take place there. There's an underserved area in terms of FIA support, one can only hope that grants withheld from Russia and Belarus can be turned towards the nation in their post-war recovery once the greater evils of the invading forces has been corrected. The Ukrainian tour and series has survived no matter the litany of mountains it has had to overcome over the years. It might be small in one way, but like the tenacity of the people of the country right over the last year, it has shown that success is relative to passion. When I began this project, I contacted Sergei Saitar from Bitlock, who kindly provided the UEA2 and footage that was used from what you've just watched. Um, in the correspondence that went back and forth between us, he wrote this. The Russian invasion broke up all our plans for the 2022 season and also the next few years. 
Some of our athletes, organisers, race marshals, photographers and cameramen are defending our country with the Ukrainian army. Some others are making a huge effort in volunteer work. And all of this instead of racing. We can't run these competitions and championships while Russian missiles are flying over our head. Now, plainly hosting motorsport events in Ukraine right now, it's, it's not the forefront of anybody's mind and it won't be for a while. But the country does have drivers internationally representing and, and flying the flag in, in like FIA games, in Formula 4, uh, and in a number of disciplines. But the day will come when racing will return to Ukraine and I think it's important that the international motorsport community bonds together to try and help to, to bring back the only track that's in the country. In fact the dream would be to bring it up the FIA Grade 3 or Grade 2 and, and to bring championships from across Europe to celebrate motorsport and, and to relaunch it when the time's right. For right now the, the, the story of the Ukrainian Touring Championship, in fact all motorsport in Ukraine should serve as a testament and an inspiration to show what can be achieved with passion even if you don't have what other people would consider to be all of the tools. Just one thing left to say, United 24, Ukrainian government initiative where you can donate to one of three sections, medicine, infrastructure and the Ministry of Defence or you can donate all three of them. Go and give it a look. Сподіваюся, що ви отримали задоволення від цієї події. Не менше, ніж я коментуючи її для вас. Спасибі, що були під час її.